Tesla also started in 2000 in UK and in India we started around 2004. So close to two decade old organization. And as the name represents, we only do independent quality assurance and quality engineering. And so we don't do anything outside software testing. And whatever we do within testing, we do it end to end, right? From any type of testing, whether it is manual, automation, not for the testing per se. That's about the background about Tesla. So this is the brief agenda that I have, right? So we'll talk about some the key trends. And we'll talk about some of the performance outages, right? What went we we'll do some analysis on what, what went right or what went wrong, right? And the need for uh, performance testing. What <laughs> the brand that we trust, right? It could be Google, Insta, Flipkart. When we see, we'll be disheartened, right? Because these are the applications which are supposed to be up and available 24-7, 365 days in a year, right? And this is a challenge when the application do not handle that anticipated load or the peak load. And that is what we are trying to address through performance engineering or performance. Engineering. So it is very rare. You could have seen these errors. Site went down literally in 20 minutes. And there were more than 1 lakh of users currently trying to access that phone, right? Just the brand uh, new phone that was launched in Flipkart and it literally in the 60th minute Flipkart site went down. Users were not able to log in, users were not able to buy their phone and this is exactly the error message that you got. Right? Now talking about the server side errors, 500 is a very generic word, right? So it says internal server error or if you are using on mobile, you just say something went wrong. There are several possible reasons for that, whether the there could be misconfiguration in the server side, but whether it is a bad gateway or 503 service enabled, I'm sure you would have heard this. But these are the errors that we need to be very careful, right? So most of the time, these errors occur when the system is not able to handle that traffic or the load. And that's where we come across these errors. I think we heard one common name during the COVID times, right? Pandemic. Now, when the neighboring states of Karnataka and Tamil Nadu started opening up slowly, I'm talking about bare fuel, that thing I'll call beverage outlet. So the government in Kerala anticipated a huge crowd, right? And to minimize that, this application was designed and built, right? Uh, as the name stands queue, it's actually virtual queue management, right? So typically what it does, you can download the application on your mobile application, uh, you can download the application on your mobile, right? You can sign up, take a token nearest to your home, Right. There, there are close to 800 outlets across Kerala that were integrated into the application. And the application is supposed to generate a token. You can take that token, book your slot, and go to any nearest uh, beverage outlet, buy a call, come back, and sit for next four days. The next slot will be after four days. This is a simple theme. So yes, there was certain delays uh, in terms of the application development, deployment. Right? And finally, when it went to Play Store, uh, there were some uh, complaints that any application needs to add to when it goes into the Google Play Store or the Apple Play Store. So this application failed some basic checks, right? It had to be bought out. And then again, the configurations were in place. And finally, they went delayed uh, live. I think I have the timelines and the evidence as well. So this is around 27th of May. Late in the evening, they went live. Right. The virtual queue management were uh, very great initiative from the government, right? Because end of the day, talking about uh, May 2020, right? Uh, you, the core objective for the government was to reduce that uh, the crowding, right? So that the disease does not uh, spread, right? If somebody is infected in that crowd, and this application was successfully launched in the late evening on 27th, 28th is when the real users started, you know, logging or registration. There are close to a lakh users in less than hours who are trying to you know download this application and register. And within a couple of hours, the issue started popping up. Right. So the first and foremost thing is OTP, right? And you sign in right? or, or you sign up, right? There's an OTP that is sent on mobile number. And when I tried, the validity of that OTP was five minutes, but I got the OTP probably around the 10th minute. I'm talking about the application which went live. I'm taking this example because I think this is very close to our 
heart or liver because they have you are have heard about it right so now the next thing is the people who got ODP were not able to know register or the pin code that was fetched was wrong the, the objective was to know find an outlet very close by maybe within five kilometer radius but people started getting the token issued maybe few, as far as 50 kilometers right so the purpose was not met and often the users started getting messages like something went wrong so they have to again reinstall register so it's almost all the users got frustrated right so i'm talking about a huge number here about a one lakh and what are the consequences it even hit the i know i mean for the opposition these are the reasons that you know uh, are good enough to strongly oppose the government right it's a great initiative went wrong and this made the national uh, headline right on the very next day application of lockdown 27 and 28 it says the bakery app starts on a wrong footing kerala and consequences of this i have almost read 30 to 40 percent of the reviews right and there were more than one lakh one million downloads close to one lakh plus downloads and if you look at the people who have rated there 24,000 people less than one hour they went and rated one star and each one commented saying if there was a zero star i would have or negative i would have done that but right, they were also requesting google can take you raise some exception so that they can rate negative or zero and you can clearly see the screenshot that i've taken right the one star but almost out of 30 80 percent users were frustrated with this application that's a big disaster it's not just limited to one application there are big names I have listed here. Right? Everybody has been waiting for open software. And what is the com common key takeaway from here? Whenever there is any initiative or there is a launch, you need to anticipate that you are attracting or you are pulling more users because of those campaigns that you are running or because of those offers that you are running or because of those promotions that you are running. Right? And if your system is not prepared to handle that anticipated or uh, anticipated on the peak load, then uh, you need to be prepared for this, uh, this, this sort of disasters where the application will definitely come down. Right? It will not be able to handle that peak load. So I'm sure all the evidence is there. Nobody is spared from uh, the uh, performance outage. Right? So when I say performance outage, these all applications went down for a brief period. Right? The only core reason is they're not able to handle the user load, right? And you can see it is not specific to one domain, right? So they're all across the domains. So when I say domain, various business lines, right? And none of the none, none of them are doing charity, right? They're all running business online, right? For example, Zomato or SBI, or you can see the names across various uh, industry verticals, right? If I take one small example, right, a downtime of half an hour can lose up to two to three millions of revenue. Right, that's the kind of impact that we're talking about, right? And that's the reason nobody wants their application to fail when they go live. Right. So I hope this some of these insights addresses the next question: Why do we need to test the performance of an application? Right. So I already covered through some of the examples, right? How it can impact uh, end users. Now, there are a lot of advantages by doing performance testing. One of the things is we can avoid these failures of critical or business uh, applications. Right. The next one is, can be rest assured that once the application is deployed, right, the application is expected to work uh, in the real world condition. You can locate any potential uh, issues or bottlenecks as we call it before the de uh, deployment. Right. Because we talk about a lot of things around cloud, right? Everybody thinks that, okay, uh, even I was told uh, about five years back, since there is cloud, you guys will lose your job or you guys will not have any job. But we end up doing more job in the current because we know cloud is not the answer for scalability, right? So a small application, right? You cannot have, afford to have 10 web servers or 10 application servers and database with TR and other things, right? Cloud, cloud always comes, infrastructure always comes with a cost. And by doing effective performance testing, you can bring down your uh, infrastructure cost by baselining, benchmarking, and ensuring you have an optimal running infrastructure. Right? So you can even bring down the infrastructure cost by doing that.
it has several benefits for various stakeholders right obviously business is more important uh, they want to do or to protect their brand, uh, brand right so they don't want to have their brand damaged and they go live that's what the business expects right and of course you want to be ahead of your competition right so you like uh, project took an example of various uh, e-commerce engines right and if you look at their response like right, it covered more from the ui perspective and also about the ux perspective right uh, if you try to log in or you try to browse various pages from mintra flipkart amazon walmart right they all serve your purpose so if you try to search probably your results are going to come within two seconds right if not maybe probably less than two seconds right so that's the kind of experience that we're talking about uh, and you need to ensure your application is performing and it is baseline right is as good as your, your competition and of course uh, one of the business benefit is you can reduce hardware by optimizing uh, by optimally connecting the power system mm-hmm. right of course for architects and devs right we can even tell you right from the breakdown right so if you, let's say we conduct testing concurrent test for final users we can give breakdown right from layers to classes to methods right at that once you know which is the method that is we find to or which is the classes that need to be looked into it gives a lot of value and for end users how does it help for people like us right so we will be much confident to perform our transactions or interact with that application today the slow time is the down time Right. So, application is not of me within few seconds. I'm sure the customer is not going to come back to your portal for any sort of uh, business or interactions. Right. And right now, what uh, we are saying is when we are moving toward everything towards digital performance, plays a very key role uh, in the digital uh, era today. I just wanted to bring some distinction between what is performance testing and what is performance engineering. Right. So, a lot of people do not have a good concept or understanding about performance testing and load testing. To, to make it very simple, so load testing is simulating real world conditions. Right. So let's say if you have an e-commerce application, right, and you are expecting 500 users. Out of 500 users, probably you know 30% of users are trying to make some search, or 20% of users are trying to ask uh, product to cart or make payments. Right. So this is what the workload breakdown that we do, and that's what exactly we do the in load testing. Our objective is to simulate real world condition, right? Users coming in from various locations, from various networks, trying to perform various business process, right? And that's what we, uh, is a real world uh, simulation. And then we see how the uh, response of the application is. So as the name suggests, the next one type of testing is called stress testing. Here the objective is to understand at what point the application starts to degrade or at what point the application starts the breaking point. Right? So we want to know whether the system that we have today right, will support 1,000 concurrent users or 2,000 concurrent users. Right? So when I said concurrent, all the users are trying to you know, perform a similar sort of task in the application. The other type of testing is called SOAK or endurance. Right? So SOAK and endurance is basically running our test for an extended period. Right? So we have a couple of users run throughout uh, maybe for a complete day. Right, 500 users trying to access the same repeated task for, for a day and then trying to see if there is any memory leaks in the application. Spike testing, like I mentioned earlier, it is again a great uh, type of testing that we need to adopt. I know there is any sudden increase or decrease in the load, right? whether your system is able to handle and come back to the, the origin state. And that's also one of the type of testing, which is called spike testing. Now, the difference between performance testing and performance engineering. Right? So, the practice of evaluating uh, application in terms of its responsiveness and uh, under particular workload, right? So workload here is nothing but user load right, distributed across various um, uh, workflow, work, use cases. That's why I'm calling it. Now, performance engineering is more proactive. It's a continuous uh, end-to-end application performance testing, monitoring, and what we do in performance engineering, right? It's more of profiling uh, optimizing, fine tuning, capacity planning, and uh, there are various types of monitoring which I will talk about. Now, what is shift right? Shift right is how can we take, I think uh, Anup mentioned about this, right? Testing in production, or how can we make use of the statistics of the users or the various details that is already there in the production, right? 
and how can you use that as the feedback or loop to improve your test to simulate the uh, real world condition? And that's why we're talking about shift left and shift right. Continuous performance testing, as we already know by now, right? This is nothing but running your performance test as part of CICD. Right? So we, we know there is a lot of people in our community who are already well versed with uh, automation testing, for example, but uh, we need to bear in mind it's a simple performance test also to be can be run as part of your CICD pipeline. Right? So that is possible today. I will talk about observability and uh, monitoring in uh, detail in the next slide. Uh, but this is one of the key trends that we're seeing. There is a heavy emphasis that is given on given on the monitoring part. There are various types of monitoring, that right? it could be about the application monitoring, about the infrastructure monitoring. But I have a slide that we talk about what the uh, various tools that are available and what exactly we mean by monitoring and the observability. The other thing that we see is the cloud-based performance system. So, like if you want to let's say because most of you are familiar with the automation test deep right? And when you when it comes to performing your compatibility test, right? When you want to increase your test coverage, there are already tools which are available like Source Labs, Browser Stack, right? Where the same automation script, if you want to run in multiple browsers, multiple OS, multiple devices, right? It makes no sense to have that sort of infrastructure in-house, right? Because maybe you would, you would be running this for a couple of hours and it doesn't make sense to buy those devices or hardware rather than uh, rather go to the any cloud-based solution signed you know it's available on subscription based or user space now the same thing is that uh, is available today for performance testing and there are a uh, list of tools i'm going to share in the next slide right, which, you, which are based on subscription why it is important so we've done test as high as half million tests concurrent tests right and we did this during the pandemic time when one of the ministry uh, decided to conduct exams online and it's one of the biggest uh, country in the Middle East and, and they were expecting half million uh, students right it was both for colleges and uh, schools now there was no way we could have done this on premise or we, there was no time as well for us right so there was already an announcement made by the ministry of education and including us and other vendors there were other nine vendors uh, who are supporting us in terms of development, infrastructure, hosting, other things, right? We all were, there was a deadline that was given and we all were asked to work backwards, right? And we literally had to be very innovative and we did our hands with the, uh, uh, the cloud providers, right? And those who have a bit of background from performance testing will imagine or will understand what load we're talking about, right? So handling 5 lakhs users, right? Uh, you require a very sophisticated hardware, right? So now if I take an 8 GB machine and you want to conduct load testing, that 8 GB machine probably will support 3 GB users. So now we can do your mathematics. If I want to support 5 lakh users, how many machines I would require, right? Now I would need to install, there is a small component called load generator that is responsible for injecting the load, or generating the load, and it has to connect to a controller, right? Now it literally for a single person, or even if you have a small team, it will be practically impossible to have all these configurations done uh, in-house. And for this reason, there are cloud-based solutions. Right? So if you have some large uh, volume of tests that needs to be conducted in very short duration. Right? So these are subscription-based tools is already configured. You just say 10,000 you want to test it, you are, it will be up and running, and you can start your execution literally within a few minutes because the tool is already connected with the available uh, cloud VMs and you can just spin up VMs in a couple of seconds and your test is good to go. So there's no additional contribution that needs to be done for sale. And it's a great value because most of the performances that we run is probably one hour, two hour, right? And there is no brainer why we need to install and have these on premise, right? So just leverage whatever is there on the cloud. By now, I think you already know what is cloud system, right? So this again started by Netflix. They have now open source that product is called Kiosk Monkey. There's also another product called Kremlin, which is used. Right. So Kiosk testing, in my simple terms, right? It is moving from what if to when. Right. So what if it fails? Moving from there when it fails. Right. So now what we're doing in uh, Kiosk testing is we we talk we, we saw about uh, the microservices, right? So the the entire architecture is being revamped to microservices today 
right? So now in kiosk testing, we are actually introducing a failure. This failure can happen from various angles. It's a controlled failure, right? It could be making a disk full and seeing you know, whether the application is resilient. One of the key objective why we are doing kiosk testing is how resilient your application is, right? Introducing failure in one part of the application or one part of the service and seeing whether the other services are getting affected and how fast it can throw it back. Right? When you stop that or when you recover, the application should also be recovered. Right? When you stop that failure or you bring back that online. Now, it could be done at various levels right? because failures can happen at various levels. It can be because of hardware failure. It can be because of network failure. It can be because of web server going down, database service going down, or it can be a small service that is going down, right? It can be also within hardware, you can drill down, right? Like I mentioned, it can be disk level or it can be CPU, right? So we're just trying to be more proactive and measure the resiliency of the system, right? How resilient that system is if something goes wrong. And that's exactly what is Netflix is doing today. And they opened up these tools and the process for the wider audit, where you can leverage that. And yes, we, we, we do have done testing in the production, of course, during not the peak period, but during the off-peak when there are when it's not uh, impacting the customer. But production test low testing in production comes with its own pros and cons. We need to be literally you know, be aware where we need to leverage. So now putting all this together, I'm sure if you have background about uh, DevOps will be able to very closely relate to this. And DevSecOps is is already a framework that is available today, where security testing has become a shared responsibility. Similarly, we are calling this as the DevOps, DevOps, where performance testing also can be part of your DevOps. Right. So shift left is on the left hand side, where these are the kind of tasks that uh, activities that we, we can do as part of performance testing. You start earlier in the life cycle of an SDLC, right? Right from we talked about the unit level, uh, component level, right? Okay, there are tools that are available which directly integrates with your ID, which is used by your development team today, right? It could be uh, Visual Studio or Eclipse, which will help measure the performance of your board. Similarly, for every build, you can keep a check of uh, suit of performance test scripts, which you can run as part of your CSCD. And once you have the interface available, you can run your end-to-end -end test, right? So this is basically simulating the real world conditions or various types of uh, tests that I mentioned. That these are the some of the performance validation that we can do on the on the left hand side. On the right hand side, so obviously synthetic monitoring, right? So uh, I think one of the speakers in the morning mentioned about in the production, right? So why people are this is a proactive way of monitoring the system, right? So synthetic monitoring is nothing but, let's say I'm running Flipkart or I'm running any e-commerce. I know what are the critical business process for my revenue, for my revenue generation, right? If the payment fails, then there is no fund, right? Because at the end of the day, my revenue is depending on how many users come and buy the particular product, right? So just to keep a check, health check on the payment, right? I can design a script and I can run it throughout the day, right? So if, if, if if there is any failure, you are the first person to get that alert because you are running there, right? So before even customer can identify that issue, you are already aware there is an issue with the particular payment gateway or any business critical business process. And that's what we call as synthetic monitoring, right? So there's a script which is automatically going and checking a particular business process and it is sending you an alert. You can even send you an alert on your mobile, your SMS, email, various types of alert can be configured. So that even before your end user gets to know that issue, you already know that issue and it is very easy to fix so that your end user doesn't get affected. Now, there are various types of monitoring. Um, real user monitoring, there are, uh, uh, I have the next slide where I talk about various tools that are available to you know, achieve various types of uh, performance testing, monitoring and cloud-based uh, testing. So here, to talk about, uh, specifically talking about monitoring, right? so monitoring is, for an application, right? So if you look at from client to server, so your browser, if I'm going to google.com, right? So what we're doing is we open up a browser. Let's say I'm going to search for test house, for example, right? So as an end user, what I do, I open Google, I go to google.com and in this 
search bar and the desktop, right? And then wait for the response, right? So now behind the scene, what happens? So first you have a uh, domain DNS, right? So Google understands yeah. that I'm a user coming from a particular IP, right? It goes find out the nearest uh, server. Now if you look at the architecture a long way now, we have a distributed component. You have uh, NNB, that is not network load balancer. So this is the first layer. Obviously, prior to that, you may have firewalls and other network peripherals, which I don't want to get into. But behind the scene, as an user, you are just searching for desktops. But this request has to go through the network load balancer. Then it goes to the next available web server. Right? From web server, it goes to application server. Application server, server is where the code is residing, the code is sitting. The code gets executed. Then it goes to database. right? And database is where your metadata and the data is kept. From database, it comes back to application server, back to web server, and then back to browser, where your pages are rendered, right? And we can see all this magic happening within less than two seconds, right? But behind the scene, right, it's a very, complex, very uh, comprehensive and complex process that runs, right? Uh, just be it a simple search or simple authentication or making a payment, right? In certain cases, there is a handshake that happens between multiple providers, right? So take example of uh, any e-commerce, right? So e-commerce, you can, you have, uh, let's let's say we get it to the payment page. It's not only e-commerce, anything where you want to shop online or you want to buy online, right? So they need to integrate with several banks, several UPIs uh, for making payment. Right. These are third-party integration, right? So, so practically, you have a small modular components moving around and getting to that best expected uh, end result. Right? A failure in one component can be disaster. Right? And monitoring is one piece which will help you track end to end, right? irrespective of whether it is done in house or it is interacting with third party. It actually uh, see it 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 traps us through the entire. Uh, journey that I just mentioned, right, from the client to all the servers and back, right. So just give a small example of what drill down I can get as a performance engineer from monitoring. So let's say login took 10 seconds, right, it can be any login, for example. Now, thanks to monitoring tools, right, we can do that similar to what you do on RCA, right, those cause uh, analysis. That 10 seconds, with the help of monitoring tools, I can break it down. How much of time was spent on the network? How much time of that was spent on the web server, on the application server? That is where the code is getting executed. How much time was spent on the database, right? Which was the query that was run, which is the slowest query that was run, right? And then from, like I mentioned, from layers to classes to methods. I can make her look at the uh, development team very happy and Telling this is a method that needs to be fine tuned, right? That all matters to them, right? He doesn't want to hear all the big story. Right? If I tell him this, hey, this method is a problem, can you just go and fine tune that? I can bring down by five. If I know probably 90% of the time is spent on this particular method, right? And if I fine tune, my performance can be brought down from 10 seconds to one second by just fine tuning that one particular method. Now, to get to that, so you need to have all the agents installed, and that is where the monitoring plays uh, a key role. Low testing, it's an open source tool, doesn't stop anyone, can just go ahead, you don't even have to install, right? It's available as a binary, you can just double click on the batch file and you are up and running. Although Nestos is very tool obviously, but every tool has got its own pros and cons, right? So you need to really know where you are getting into, what you are getting into. And if you really have a very business critical application or an enterprise application, a lot of out-of-box support that is there by the commercial tools, but not by the open source tools. But if it is a simple HTTP, HTTPS, or web service, JMIT is obviously the best choice. We can just go ahead and use that. But apart from that, there are tools available, and the common ones is Lodapath, which is there in the industry for close to 20 plus years now. Um, it's again because of the, the support they have for various applications, right? It can be enterprise application um, or um, web application, mobile mobile application. And that is where they are very quite uh, famous in that. There are also tools from Neotis, which is part of Tricetis now. It's again near low. 
So these are the tools that are there on the performance testing right, which will help you do the load testing, spike testing, performance testing. And on the monitoring side, uh, there are tools like Direct Trace, App Dynamics. So unfortunately, none of them are open source. They're all commercial tools because of the depth of you know, the information they need to gather. And of course, uh, there are cloud-based solutions for performance testing. All these are centered around the performance testing uh, or the cloud solutions. Now, good thing about cloud solution, it's the same engine, right? Uh, whether your scripts are written in Jupyter or uh, in Lordner, you can take them to cloud and then quickly start uh, running them. So, this is some of the list of tools. Uh, but if I can just talk about which is very lightweight and you know, very user friendly. If you are already familiar with the JMeter scripts and you want to run it for 10,000 users, you don't have the required hardware. So BlazeMeter is one of the such platform where you can just the existing JMeter scripts, you just need to copy to BlazeMeter, right? And then you say how many users, how many hours you want to test, right? and then you can typically uh, less than five minutes, you can run your test in BlazeMeter. Right? So that's the power it, uh, the cloud solution provides. So mostly these are useful when you want to know run for a very high volume of test, high user load, uh, definitely is that very much valuable. So that's all I had. And if you have any questions, I'm more than open.